5.30 p.m. and I now call to order the Grand Island Public Schools Board of Education meeting. This is the Monday, December 12th, 2022 meeting. Notice of this meeting has been advertised in the Grand Island Independent, which is the district's designated method of giving notice of these meetings. We want those in attendance to know that copies of the Open Meetings Act are available at the entrance to the boardroom. If anyone in attendance is interested in addressing our board, you are welcome to do so. We simply request that you complete the appropriate form and turn it into us so that you may be recognized during the request to address the board part of our meeting. If you have not already completed this form, please see the staff person outside the entrance to this room. Public comment is welcome. We do ask that no signs be brought into the boardroom. Mrs. Dibbert, will you please call roll? Mrs. Albers? Present. Mr. Barsonis? Present. Mrs. Hinkle? Present. Mr. Hawley? Here. Mrs. Jurgens? Present. Dr. Bros? Here. Ms. Wolf? Yes. Mr. Brown? Present. Mr. Holinsky? Present. Next, we'll have our mission statement, Mr. Barsonis. Hey, I have it. Do want, should we take turns? Okay, How, wait, I'll read the first part. Okay. <laughs> every student, every day is success. In educating students, we teach hearts as well as minds. Within the school district of Grand Island, every student has access to high quality, cultural, responsive, and engaging learning environments. Every student will develop literacy skills across disciplines. Every student is socially and emotionally equipped to thrive in the school and in life. Every student will graduate as a college, career, and community-ready citizen. Thank you. Four, we have the consent agenda. 4.1, meetings from the previous month's meeting. Acceptance of agendas from standing committees. Claims as submitted. 4.4, staff adjustments as submitted. 4.5, treasurer's report as submitted. 4.6, policy, no policy tonight. 4.7, approval of agenda as submitted. This is the consent agenda as published. Would anyone like to remove any items or add any items to the consent agenda? Does anyone have any potential conflict of interest on agenda item 4.3? If so, please state the check number that you will be abstaining from voting on. I make a recommendation to approve the consent agenda as submitted. Mr. Barsonis and Mr. Brown, do we have any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes. Five information item, 5.1 Hope Squad, 545 Zoom presentation. Sure, that'd be great, yeah. Uh, six, special recognition. 6.1, Superintendent's Holiday Card Contest winners. Mrs. Worthington. Okay, good evening. This is one of the most fun things we do every year is the holiday card contest. Um, as usual, it's, I say it's fun because our students love it. We have a stack like this of cards. Um, I don't know, just reading the title, sorry. It's getting to me. I should have just said holiday card contest and been good with it. So I would like to ask Penelope, Brooke, and Marvin, if you'll come stand right here, please. We select um, a card from each level. We have the staff here in the building vote on them and then make the final um, decisions with the superintendent. So I'm gonna share our three cards with you this year. This was our elementary level and this is Penelope's card. She is a fourth grade student at Engelman. The middle school card is Brooke Miller. She is a seventh grade student at Westridge. And this one we selected from the high school is Marvin Poto and he is in 10th grade at Grand Island Senior High. And then we have the tough decision, well not I, but our superintendent and um, Mitch or whoever we, we talk to from the communications department, but they choose the one that we print and send out. 
And so this year, this is the card that we will print and send out. And if you can't read it, it says, like all, um, we are all unique like snowflakes. And we just felt like that represented our district so well. So Penelope, I'll let you go first and get your certificate. And then we'll have you go up front and we'll take a photo. And would family members of these students stand to be recognized as well? Thank you for encouraging. There are six Thank you all very much. She come. Yep. We're going faster than I thought. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that never happens. <laughs> um, so I'll give you a little background. Um, the Hope Squad, Dr. Hudnall, will be presenting, and he um, resides in Utah. Um, he is the one that created the Hope Squad. He was a high school principal and had um, several suicides in a year and just couldn't take it anymore. He needed to, to get it stopped. And so he did uh, all kinds of research, pulled people together. Um, I was in Utah for a conference specifically on mental health, and um, Utah is a little different. I mean, they've really taken this on, and um, if you know of the, I believe it's 888 um, call number, just like 911, um, it started with their senator in Utah and um, then went across the nation. The problem that most states have is that you never know who you're going to get when you call. You might get a call center in Montana, but you're in Nebraska. And um, so it's, they've had all kinds of glitches, but Utah hasn't. They put a lot of money behind it um, to get that going so that um, e anyone can get help um, when they have suicidal thoughts. The part of the, the Hope Squad, the reason why we're presenting it to you tonight, just as information, just to get a feel for what you think about being able to implement this in our high school, um, when we brought on um, uh, Mr. Jaden to Jaden, we talked about how can we get kids involved. And so we talked about a kind of a, a peer court. And um, some of our kids said, well, I don't want to dish out consequences to my friends and so we thought okay what, what's another way we can look at and so when I went to the conference I found um, heard about Hope Squad and it is about the goals of the Hope Squad is to involve students and to use their choice and voice but to create a school a safe school environment promote connectedness support anti-bullying encourage mental wellness reduce mental health stigma and prevent substance misuse and so the um, program trains uh, 
an advisor, um, an adult advisor, it could be a counselor, it could be a principal, it could be a teacher, um, to then lead a group of students. And we've talked about, well, would we do like each academy has a Hope Squad? Is it just one big one for the high school? Is it by um, grade level? So those would be all things that we would have to work out if we decide to go this route. Um, so they train the students, uh, usually over the summer, um, pretty intense training, and then the Hope Squad would meet weekly with their um, advisor and just how do we get the word out that we're here, um, how do we support students, how do we um, respect confidentiality, but they go through all of those things. And then, you know, how do you report when someone's um, in trouble? And what Dr. Hudnall has found is that peer-to-peer -peer support really has an impact. And so he'll be talking a little bit about that tonight. And um, when you think about costs, um, when the kind of the Cadillac model for curriculum would be 12,000 for four years. And so you pay 3,000 a year um, to keep the curriculum going, to keep the training going. And then after that, it would be um, $550 a year to, to maintain um, the curriculum and the support from the Hope Squad. And then there would be, for training, it would be another, my notes here, about 4,000 to get advisors trained. And that would be kind of the Cadillac version as well. They would bring the trainer to us, and so we could train more people um, a little less expensively. So, um, trying to think of anything else you might want to know. Robin, is that, um, is that training teachers or is that training the students? Both. Okay. So pretty intensive training for the advisors and then also bring the kids together, get together to train them. Um, one of the other things that we've just kicked around is student nominations um, and you, that students are nominated by their peers to be on the HOPE squad. And um, one of the questions I would like to ask Dr. Hudnall, do the nominations work or could students apply? Um, you know, how do you get that interest going so that um, you could get the... Um, students on board. The other piece of it is um, they um, strongly encourage parent involvement of the Hope Squad um, students so that they know what their child's getting into. Um, they can support them in, you know, being there for the trainings, um, working them through it because it can get pretty emotional if you have a, a, a tough issue. And so how do we support um, kids and their parents and the staff that, that work with them? Um, one of the things we learned with Hello Hero, um, our students told us that, well, could um, we have um, counselors that work with small groups so that we could, we could bounce ideas off of each other and share. And one of the main things that they have talked about is just the stress of everything they're expected to do and how do you manage it, um, how do you manage a schedule, how do you manage your schoolwork. Um, and so this is just another way to pull kids together to come up with what, what's high on your agenda um, to help support kids. And so just, it can go a million different directions and um, we just really want to work with um, Hope Squad if that's the direction we choose to go. And again tonight, um, it is about um, Dr. Hudnell really telling you the nitty gritty pieces and parts of um, where we want to go with this. So Dr. Hudnell? Thanks for being here, and um, I just gave um, the board a little bit of background, and so um, we really want to hear from you, your expertise, kind of how it got started, where you're at, and about 15 minutes, and then open it up for questions. Okay. You should be able to, I think it's your link. <laughs> That's fucky. <laughs> we have lots of rain here. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. 
in Utah was strict immigration for suicide, and uh, a partition for the average age mom was uh, almost 18 years of uh, high school principal had lost five students to suicide. Um, this gives you a kind of clear use of it, and uh, we'll go to the next one. The first things they asked him is, at what point did you notice you started to struggle? And 
ages 10 to 14 rose to the top. It's not full-blown schizophrenia, bipolar, dysthymia, but it's when they noticed that they started to really hurt. The second thing that we found, um, seven out of 10 young people before they take their lives will tell a friend. And in most cases, those friends will not tell an adult because they don't know what to do. So we looked at every program around the world. We developed into, su uh, into subcommittees and we had experts and amazing um, mental health folks on each committee. We decided to look across the world at what was going on. And there are some great programs out there. But what we found is none of them were designed by educators and none of them really understood the educational system. We educators tend to be very silo based, right? Uh, in fact, we laugh in Utah because we secondary teachers are called independent contractors because all they want to do is go into their classroom and work with their kids. But we knew we needed to break that barrier down. So we looked at all these programs and there were four pieces that, that kept rising to the top for us. Number one is we did not want a program that was one and done. As a high school principal, my counselors or whoever would go to a conference, fall in love with the keynote, buy their book, come back and say, we got to do this program. I'd write out a check for 10 or 15,000. We'd start the program, big school assembly, big, you know, a full week of everything. And then about second semester, I would follow up with them and say, hey, how's that program going? Oh, not very good. I go, what do you mean? We paid all that money. Yeah, just didn't have the rhythm to it. Second part is we knew the, the value and the importance of um, having a, in a relationship with the local mental health agency. Um, what we were doing in my district and in most districts across the country, parents would, we would identify a kid who was at risk, bring the parents in, and the parents would go, well, tell me what to do. And we'd say, sorry, we can't tell you because we'll be held liable. And so parents would walk out of there as in much confusion and frustration um, with us as their child was. So we knew we needed to have that partnership. The third piece is, as I mentioned, it needed to fit within the school system. And then the fourth piece is the importance of peer to peer. Um, there are a lot of great programs out there and some of those programs will come in and ask the school leadership team, please identify those kids are the most popular in your school because those are what we call trendsetters. What we learned early on is that as a high school principal, 15 years of student body officers, 11 of those years, they were amazing. They were just wonderful. But three or four, maybe five years out of those 15, I had kids that were rich, I had kids that were popular, and I had kids that were not very nice. It was all about them. So we really wanted the peers that the students would feel comfortable going to. So Timpview High School, right next to Brigham Young University, 2,100 students, it was our ground zero. More threats, more attempts, more suicides than any other school in our district. And we decided if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do ground zero. So we walked through every English class and we asked every young person, if you were struggling emotionally and needed to talk to someone, list the names of three of the peers that you would feel comfortable going to. And the most amazing thing happened. The same 40 names rose to the top out of 2100. So we pulled those kids together, started training them on warning signs, risk factors, self-care boundaries, and when to go to an adult because the young people are not trained to be therapists or counselors. They're trained to be the eyes and ears of the school. And here's the program. It was so successful, we put it in every school, 13 elementaries, three middle schools, and three high schools. Suicide is the third leading cause of death among youth between ages 10 to 19 years old. 1,600 youth are lost to suicide each year. However, most suicides are preventable. Youth who are contemplating suicide frequently give warning signs of their distress. Seven out of 10 will tell a friend or give a warning sign that they are struggling, but many of their friends do not tell an adult. A Hope Squad is a group of students nominated by their peers as good listeners and caring fellow students. They work closely with the local mental health agency Hope Squad students are taught by the school counselor and advisors on how to recognize suicide warning signs in their peers and provide support. Hope Squad members are trained on how to talk to a fellow struggling student. If the peer needs help, they listen and then try to convince them to go see an adult in the school. If that does not work, they inform a school counselor about their concerns about their peers. So the advisors 
can contact the student and the parents for additional help and support. Hope Squad members also bring suicide prevention awareness to the entire school by holding an annual Hope Week where fellow peers are given information about suicide prevention. For more information, please visit www.hopesquad.com. So in the program, this is an amazing school in Irvine, California. This is the definition of what a Hope Squad really is, but I think the power of it, it, it was developed by our researchers at the University of Cincinnati, is that last part of the paragraph where um, to perform, Hope Squad members are students that nominated by their peers, but most important to perform intentional outreach with fellow students. For 100 years in public health, we've told kids uh, to share with your friend, if you're hurting, just let me know and we'll get you help. We do the same thing with adults. The reality is someone struggling with a mental illness will not ask for help. They're too embarrassed, they're too ashamed, they don't understand what they're going through. So what do Hope Squad members do? They learn about mental health, self-care boundaries, reducing the stigma of mental illness. It takes two to three years to change the culture of a school. It doesn't happen overnight. Increase that help-seeking behavior, organize school-wide activities, we, as we mentioned, we partnership with local mental health agency. We focus on connectedness, anti-bullying, school safety. Um, Hope Squad curriculum is um, elementary, four through six. Brigham Young University Elementary Ed Department and the school psychologist department spent three years researching children's stories that go along with our lessons. And at elementary school to me is amazing. So they, uh, uh, they pick their book, uh, which story they want to go with each lesson. And the library librarian orders extra books and they have every class read the same story. They even encourage parents to read it to their kids. And then the sixth grade Hope Squad members go around to each class and review with them. Elementary focuses on resiliency, anti-bullying, and mental wellness. Um, we're seeing about a thousand percent increase in fourth, fifth, and sixth graders with anxiety, depression, and even cutting. Middle school, three years, high school, four, four years focusing on suicide prevention, boundary self-care, school-wide curriculum. Uh, two more slides. So um, I do focus groups every year with Hope Squad members across the country. We're now in 1,700 schools. We're in Canada. We're in South Korea. I'll be in Ghana in April. Uh, we were invited to present Northern Ireland. Um, I was invited to present to the Minister of Education in Madrid, Spain, and we were invited by NATO to present in London. Um, but this was the, I think of, of all those experiences, this is the cherished one for me. We were, I had about 80 young people on a Zoom and at the very end of it, I was asking them, tell me what we can do to improve our program. And this beautiful young lady from Florida raised her hand and said, you know, I'm angry from COVID and everything that's happened. My parents are angry. Even my teachers are angry. I'm wondering if we could learn how to forgive and talk about out of the mouth of babes, right? So this past summer, we actually wrote The Art of Forgiveness and the feedback from across the country uh, has been amazing yeah, for the adults as much for the kids. So I'll end with this video, uh, 2018, 19 school year pre-COVID. I think our lives are gonna be pre-COVID and then post-COVID, right? Um, but this is our governor. At the time, he was lieutenant governor. In the state of Utah, uh, we are funded by our legislature. Uh, we never thought we'd be out of Provo. And then some BYU professors presented on it at a national conference in Washington. President Obama reached out. I got to work with his group. And then I was invited to present to the United States Surgeon General in Congress. And then my governor heard about it. And we came back and presented. And afterwards, the governor's assistant said, we want to hope squad in every school. So. Um, we're, uh, we've been outside of Provo, this is our sixth year, seventh year, and we're in about 80% of all the schools. But in 2018-19 school year, we actually did a I'm a Hope Squad parent campaign. So we went throughout the state and at schools to give us some of the names of their parents. And um, about two weeks later, I got a call from the governor's office and my secretary stuck, stuck her head in and said, Lieutenant Governor's on the phone. I thought I was in trouble. And so I answered the phone and he said, hey, what's this thing that you're doing? I'm a Hope Squad parent. So I kind of explained it to him and he said, well, why didn't you ask me? And I said, uh, sir, you have to be a Hope Squad parent. And he smiled and he said, I am Greg. And I went, okay. And he goes, I wanna do a video. So he's now our governor. He uh, was elected this past January and he, he's just a phenomenal individual. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox. I was born and raised in the small town of Fairview, and I'm raising my four kids there on the farm that my great-great-great-grandfather settled over 160 years ago. I went to North Sampy High School, and unfortunately, when I went there, we didn't have Hope Squads. I, I, I've talked about this before. I struggled with, uh, with suicidal thoughts when I was young, and fortunately, I was surrounded by some really good people who helped me through those very dark times. We've looked at the research and we know that hope squads and peer to peer groups in our high schools are incredibly important to help reduce suicide in our schools. I am so excited to have hope squads now at North Sampy High School and my own son Caleb has been able to serve on the hope squad for for several years. It's amazing to watch as these kids reach out to their peers to help those who are struggling to help their their friends and and students know that there is a place with people who care about them where they can feel acceptance where they can feel love where they can find someone to talk to where where we have students looking out for others who may be marginalized who may be suffering and uh, who may be thinking of of ending their own lives we need more hope squads we need more students on hope squads i'm so excited to see i've been able to travel the state and talk to hope squads all over the state and see the incredible things that they are doing to help prevent suicide in our schools. I am Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox and I am a proud, oops, what do you say? I'm a proud Hope Squad parent. Boy, I blew that one, didn't I? I'm so nervous about time. I wanna make sure that I uh, respect your time. Um, anyway, at the very end, he says, I'm a hope, proud Hope Squad dad. Um, this is our story that's uh, on Amazon. It's eight or 10 bucks, but it talks about our journey and everything that we've gone through. And um, so that's the Hope Squad program. And you, you received the 50 minute presentation in uh, 15 and a half minutes. You're awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Hednall. What about questions? You had We've had over uh, 10,000 10, kids referred for help and over 2,100 hospitalized throughout the country because of the kids. Wow. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say this is an amazing program. And I mean, obviously, you've been sharing and all, you know, Dr. Grover, you've shared with us, Dr. Dexter and teachers have shared with us about the kids and and. I mean, we, it was there before the pandemic, but it's obviously even more prevalent after the pandemic. And so I think this sounds like a, a great program. Um, I love the hope about it. I've been reading a book on hope recently and about how, what a difference that makes in children's lives and all facet of their life and, you know, educational wise, as well as this. And so, you know, I won't probably be voting on this since I won't be here next month, but um, I hope it's something that it doesn't sound like very much for the benefits seem tremendous. So thank you for presenting it tonight. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And just to give you, sorry, um, some, some data from our district, we have a suicide awareness team and, and we have um, social workers who monitor. And for the 2021 school year, we had a total of 27 hospitalizations. For the 21-22, we had 26 hospitalizations. And at the end of September, we had 20 hospitalizations this year. So it's, it's out there, it's real. Um, we do have a partner like Dr. Hudnall talked about. Um, Mid Plains has really been there for us. And um, you know we can refer a kid, the parents take them. Um, they can do another more in-depth screening. And, um, and then the really difficult part, difficult part about Nebraska is finding that next placement where the, the student can go to get help. But, um, but our, our suicide awareness team is awesome and very excited about this. Um, we, you know, I'm always looking for money, but we have a s real close to getting approval for a grant um, to support the high school and Westlawn Elementary. But we were talking about with the high school, uh, Matt Schultz is our coordinator and using the extended learning opportunities to kind of be the, the support for a HOPE squad at the high school. Um, so Mr. Hubbard, Matt Schultz, Mr. Gilbertson um, have all been a part of the discussion and digging in to get the definition. So um, more questions. Mrs. Jurgens. Okay. 
For my day job, uh, the job that I get paid to do, I also, I work with young people and I was almost late to a meeting tonight, to this meeting, because I had a student come in. I, sorry, it's okay. It's okay. Hmm. Hold on, I'm gonna get it together. I had a student come and talk to me about her, her struggles and she has spoken with her parents about these struggles and her, one of her parents called her a snowflake for communicating her struggles and have declined uh, getting her help for that. And this student lost a very close friend but because they took their own life. And you know, I, I just, this is so fresh on my mind, so I'm very sorry, but, um, you know, I just constantly am thinking about the destigmatization that is needed to have success in this space. Our students, our young people, our adults need to know that not only do they have resources, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with communicating your struggles. In fact, it's so important. And um, I am very thankful that we are in, that, that Dr. Dexter, you've done the legwork to bring this to us. I think it's very timely. The numbers speak for themselves in terms of why this is uh, crucial and life-saving. And um, thank you, Dr. Hudnell, for putting this together. I could not be more impressed. Mr. Hawley. Um, I noticed on your, on your map, Nebraska was already on there with having um, Hope Squad implemented in some of the schools. I'd like to go on record and say that I think we need to contact our senator and see if we cannot get this in front of the legislature to try and find funding for the state to implement this across in all schools. I like how you think, Mr. Hawley. I was talking to Colby Coash before this meeting, so yeah, I have him on, I have him on speed dial, so that's awesome. Um, Mr. Helensky. I like this program. Um, I know I chatted with Lisa a little bit about it about a month ago when it was first brought up. In my opinion, where these programs, I'm not saying that yours in general, but in general, I'm generalizing all the programs together, where um, I think that they fail is there's no follow-up. There's no point person. What makes Hope Squad different? Is there a point person per city, per school district, um, or is there an, an 800 number that they have to call? Um, I think it's important that uh, you have to have boots on the ground, especially with these types of situations. Um, is, there, is, is that how it works? Is there someone on the ground here in Grand Island? Maybe I, if I could just uh, kind of talk the outline and then you can talk about your specific area. But um, one of the things we do is we train the young people as they become the eyes and ears. Um, to make those referrals. But even before then, um, uh, Dr. Doug Gray, child psychiatrist at the University of Utah has been our mentor. And um, one of the things that he has taught me through the years is that you can have 100 students referred to the school counselor for suicidal ideation, meaning that they're contemplating attempting suicide or, or thinking about it. He goes on to say that 97 of those young people would never need to see a professional if they just had a friend to talk to. The number one reason young people take their lives is they feel all alone. Um, and then the second reason is that they feel that they're a burden. So what part of the training, your advisors will go through a six hour certification training and your, your system will be developed so that the new 988 system, which is the national hot mental health not hotline for everything, uh, actually, we'll, we'll come back down to the area, and uh, uh, the young people are trained. Um, they're trained on how to use that system and then when to report, et cetera. So from, from a program overview, uh, that's our main goal. And then I'll turn it over to your mental health people. Thank you. And that's when Dr. Hudnell said it's really important to have that mental health partner. Again, Mid Plains is our in Grand Island support, and, um, and then they work with us to refer out or get counseling um, in the community. So. Dr. Dexter, I just wanted to confirm those numbers that you gave of, um, was it kids that were hospitalized? 
so it was 20 for a year, 20 per year, but then this year you've already had 20 hospitalized just through September. Yes, and that's K-12. And, and we really see um, the most suicide ideation coming forward um, at the elementary level. And you know, people will say, well, it's all because of bullying. And we also keep our data um, that the majority of it is number one trauma somewhere in the student's life, and then um, you know, things going on in the home, anger, divorce, you know, just things that the, the student's really struggling with. And so when Dr. Hudnell talks about having that friend to talk to, um, that's so important. Um, because when you're going through that, you tend to keep it inside, and then it just boils and boils and boils. But, but yeah, um, you know, we had a, a preschooler that had a plan and knew where the gun was, and you know, and that just blew me away. Mm -hmm. So, so yes. Thank you, Erica. Um, having once had a plan um, when I was in high school here, um, I think that this is a. Um, valued and much needed program. Luckily, I had shared what my plan was. Um, and some people told my parents, and then I wasn't very excited about that. Um, but I was going to say, um, we see it even at the, the next level in post-secondary education as well. Um, and so if it's just one of those things that continues to keep getting shoved down and shoved down at some point in time, um, there's going to be an act. So um, I do see the value. I just had a question in regards, I know we're looking at starting at the high school. Um, do we have hopes and dreams if there was all the money in the world um, that we would extend this down into like junior or junior high? Where do, where do I, where am I? Hmm. Um, middle school um, and then into the elementary. Is that kind of what we, we hope to do? And then if that is the case, if we bundle it, um, what kind of opportunities in regards to discounts would there be? Dr. Hudnell, uh, do you have kind of like, do you start at elementary? Should you start at the high school? Is it just wherever you can uh, do it? So um, we, we always advise to do the high school first, but if, if you can do all three, then that, we strongly encourage that because then you have a feeder system. Uh, because what, what you're trying to do is attack a comprehensive approach to the community. It's not just the schools, it's the communities. And so parents start talking about it and businesses and faith-based leaders and others. And so, um, you know, you, if, if you can only do one, do high school. If you can do a package deal like you're talking, that, that's what I would do. Our prices um, are going up, and, and so um, this would be a good time if if you're interested, but um, it, you know, whatever works. Thank you. Bonnie, did you have another question? No. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Cloutier, may I get you in this conversation as a high school student? What is your first read, not to put you on the spot like I am, um, but tell me your reaction to this and your, your thoughts, what are you feeling? Um, so I actually was gonna ask a, a question. Uh, it seems like this is a good way to get people referred, but uh, Dr. Dexter, um, like you said, you said like, I believe you said 97 out of 100 of them would just need someone to talk to. And I assume in this context, um, that would mean some form of counseling or therapy. Um, so what are we doing exactly to provide students with this? How frequent, how long can we continue? Uh, therapy and counseling isn't isn't free, so how does that look like if, if, if you know, a bunch of people get referred from this and then it's determined that they do need someone to talk to, um, I guess sort of how would, how would the district go about getting that accomplished? You bet. And Dr. Hudnell, we're so fortunate to have a high school student as our um, a board member. And so um, just really asking the question about, you know, if you have um, 97 out of 100 kids who need someone to talk to, does it always need to be a therapist? Is that what Hope Squad kids are for? Or can you talk to that? Yeah, so they're not therapists. They're the ones that are reaching out. I, I, and I'll give the perfect example. Just a little while ago, I walked into a Hope Squad down in Texas, and um, they were showing a picture up on the wall of a student, and the advisor said, okay, everybody, this is Sally. Um, think about her in your mind, saying hi, and then they went to the next slide. Afterwards, I walked up to the advisor, and I said, this isn't part of my curriculum. What are you doing? 
and she said, um, we had an attempt and it really affected our Hope Squad. So they wanted to memorize the names of every young person. So um, twice a week, they come in and spend 30 minutes memorizing. Because what most people don't know, right? We, we take pictures for yearbook in September, but we never use, we don't give out yearbooks till May or June. So all of that information is available for teachers. And so this um, teacher and, and our Hope Squad advisors pull it down. So then I visited with the assistant principal and I said, tell me if it's made an impact at your school. And he said, you know, he goes, it's amazing. He goes, I'm out in the hallways during class break. And um, I'll watch this kid walk by with no Hope Squad shirt, but I know he's a Hope Squad member. And he'll walk by and he'll say, hey, Sally, how are you? And Sally will stop and look at him like, who the heck are you? And then turn around, but when she starts to walk away, she has a smile from ear to ear because someone knows her. Someone has recognized her and has said hi. That's the connection piece, that's the most important. Hope Squad members are not trained to be therapists, but trained to be good listeners and know when to refer to that advisor. And we use QPR, question, persuade, refer. QPR is the number one mental health program in the world, they're in 50 states, 40, countries and they've chosen us as their school-based program and so our kids are trained on how to question how to persuade and then how to refer them to that to that uh, school counselor or trusted adult but it doesn't end there so when that young person goes out and gets therapy and then they return back to school the continuation goes on it's not a one and done kids don't we don't focus on projects we focus on building relationships and they're not best friends but they know that they're known and it's so powerful. Thank you. And we also have um, Hello Hero for a little bit longer. And um, we also have a behavioral summit. Um, we do that every year. Um, it'll be later in January where we pull all of the different uh, mental health agencies in Grand Island together to say, okay, how can we provide more support to kids? Um, and we are now have counseling from other agencies coming into the school. And so that's helping. But definitely this area, we call it the mental health desert. There just aren't the counselors out there. Thank you. And just for clarification for that too, Zach, I think he, what he was saying is that 97% of the kids don't need referred to counseling, that they just need a friend or some, a teacher or somebody to talk to, and that only 3% are actually needing counseling. Isn't that right, Dr. Hudnall? Am I saying that correctly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's correct. Only three out of those hundred need three percent need professional help because they're one out of five adults and one out of four kids struggle with some sort of mental illness. But remember, anxiety, depression, all of those fit under there. Other questions? I know you have a full evening. No, I don't think so. Thank you for your time. Yes, yes. thank you, Doctor. Really enjoyed very it very much. Yeah, bless you school board members for everything that you do. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate that. that. <clears throat> Going on now, campus highlights, uh, 7.1, reaching academic goals through intentional action steps. Julie Schnitzel, Jessica Schroeder, Tess Westover, and Jason Wiesman. Due to illness, we're down to half. <laughs> so. I'm Julie Snitzler, and I'm the principal at Howard Elementary. I'm Julie Snitzler, and I'm the principal at Howard Elementary, and just really, really proud of the students and the staff there, and our um, short presentation is just sharing about our Tier 2 
and three action steps that we are really working on after we analyze the data and we really are um, working towards meeting our academic goals by using the maps and the double data. And our goals, our action steps are aligned to the district st strategic plan as well as our um, school improvement strategies that we've um, identified through our teacher leaders. And every goal, at every grade at Howard Elementary has chosen a goal that they are choosing they, that we will we that we will meet by the end of this school year, and the levels are indicated by the or the NSCAS. We're using the NSCAS rating scheme, and so you can see up there the grade level. And they looked at their data with their dibbles from the beginning of the year in the in the fall, and decided the percentage of students they were going to be able to get proficient by May. Um, and set their individual goals. So then we're using the data to decide um, how our kids are doing and what instruction and what teachers can be doing more effectively. And this is an example of a benchmark data for second grade by standard. And you can look at the blue and the red and tell which standards that our students struggled on and which students our, our students did well on. And teachers are talking about that and reflecting on their own instruction and what they will do because of this data. Here's an example of a, um, a, a data analysis protocol that we do use with those students in, or do use with the teachers in their PLCs. And our academic coach, Jessica Schroeder, she does help lead these. And she was gonna come tonight, but she um, has a sick child, so. And then with that, Jason Wiesman is a fifth grade teacher at Howard, and he, you're gonna get a teacher's perspective of our efforts. Okay, um, so one thing my team uh, did was we utilized the data analysis protocol that you saw in the previous slide, and we used that to analyze our math benchmark that our students took back in um, September. And one of the things that um, it was helpful with was an, um, understanding where our students were with each standard, as you saw in one of those slides. Um, and from that data, we were able to retool some of our win time groups. And students um, were able to be placed into groups where they were e uh, either utilizing our new spring math intervention um, or um, getting more intensive support because we did realize some students needed um, some more targeted practice. And then we also were able to see which students are good to go and they need um, just some more um, enrichment. And so that really helped us divide that up among teachers and some of our staff that was on our team. Um, and then also we recently reused this with some of our checkups in math time. Um, and reflected on are our interventions working and um, just making sure kids are getting what they need during that win time so we're closing gaps in their learning. And so Tess Westover, who is our interventionist at Howard, she was returned to the classroom because of the teacher shortage and we're really excited to get her back the second semester. So we're um, intentionally bringing, transitioning her back and we've um, been able to get a substitute a couple times and had her go to each grade level and review the student data and the intervention groups that were created as well as the resource being used. And is it addressing the specific skill gap identified for those students? And then also our paraeducators who are helping us with those small groups are being monitored and given feedback on their instruction in those small groups of one to five or one to four students um, during WIN. And she is a great resource for those outliers for our students who maybe be um, significantly below grade level. We have students who may be even three to four years below their grade level. And she's just a really great resource she's the resource for us to teach us what resource do we need and what kind of instruction to get them gaining um, to two to three years within a year. And she's unable to be here because she's also sick, but just wanted to um, really support um, the interventionists and their, their expertise and how they can support our, our students and our teachers for those um, outliers. So it was a very quick overview of what we're doing. You're always welcome to come to Howard. We'd love to show off our teachers and our students. Are there any questions about our presentation?
I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that sometimes you have students that are three to four years below grade level. Do you find that, um, what are the commonalities between those students? Are they, um, do they have more severe trauma than other students? Do they, uh, are they EL? Are they in poverty? Are they all of the above? You know, or do you find a, a correlation there? I would just call them, they're all outliers because they're all unique. Just like the, the Christmas card, they're very, very unique and we meet as a team and talk about what this student specifically needs to be able to grow them two to three years in one year. And so um, I would say, um, in my experience at Howard, probably the biggest factor is poverty. More than anything else, poverty plays a huge role in um, student um, academics and um, we've just done a really nice job of creating systems to support those kids and families so that they can grow to three years of, of learning in a year. Thank you and thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, any other questions? I don't think so. Thanks for your time. All right, thank you. Seven point two, a few of my favorite things at Knickerum. Opal Bentley. Well, good evening. I feel like I was just here a few months ago, but this is great. I always love to come back. Um, my presentation is really about our climate and culture, our social and emotional well-being at Knickerum. Um, last time I came to see you, we talked about how we were bringing our families back into school um, after COVID. But really, in the past year and a half, we have also been very focused on the social and emotional well-being of our students, our families, and our kids. Um, and why? Why do we need to do that? Because when those things are taken care of and the kids and our teachers and our families are getting the support that they need, the academics fall into place, you know? Um, our kids and our teachers can work and grow together because they are in a good space. So here's just a little bit of our panorama data. This is our parent view. So a few of our favorite things, um, you know, from parents, we are growing and our parents are seeing that as well and we are improving in that not only just with our events. You know, we have lots of fun events just like a lot of the other schools as well too, but we're also starting to look into some parenting classes. How can we help support our parents even more? Um, and we have a wonderful social worker who is very passionate about helping our families and parents. And so, you know, she is putting together some parenting classes, but we're also starting to get our parents in more to hear what do what do they need you know how can we help su support them um, and in the white box are just a few of the comments that we had on our panorama survey as well um, you know they love our parents love to come into the schools they love to see what you know our kids are doing and as much fun as it is to see pictures on social media it's even better when they're actually in the school experiencing it with their children. Um, in January, we're gonna have a family math afternoon where during school hours, we're gonna invite our parents to come in and they're going to get to do some math activities with the kids and learn how to practice math at home too. Um, you know, we always hear about how hard Common Core is, but when you actually get in there and get to learn with your kids, it's just so much easier. So the other area we always want to focus on, of course, are our kids. We want them to feel, feel successful in school. And so we decided this year we needed to celebrate our kids more. We needed to celebrate their accomplishments. And so some of the ways that we're doing that this year is we have started Student of the Month, where teachers get to nominate a student who is showing that safe, respectful, and responsible behavior, and once a month, they get their name announced on the intercom and they get to come down and receive a little um, certificate. And our theme this year 
um, is a surfing ride, the learning waves, so they get to wear a lei for the day, so everybody knows that they um, are student of the month. And then I get to go around with our little prize cart, and we are also doing monthly perfect attendance, and those kids also get a lei, and we get their pictures. Um, and then our students are also setting personal goals. And so when they meet their personal goal, we get to celebrate them in their classroom with their classmates. We are, of course, continuing our house teams and our coins, which is always so much fun. Um, right now, if all house teams win 2,500 house team coins before break, we're gonna have a little hot chocolate party and they're so close and they have about three days left. Um, so they are super excited about that too. Another thing that has helped us this year is having our counselor and having them out of the specials rotation. Um, our counselor is able to have one-on-one -on -one time with kids who really need it, having lunch groups, having friendship groups, and that has made a world of difference this year as well too. So thank you guys for that. Um, also, just having our SICA position, our social, emotional, creative arts, you know, to fill that hole, pulling the counselor out, has made a huge difference. And for the kids to be able to express themselves through art has been amazing. Our hallways are now full of art that they have been able to do. Um, and parents love it when it comes home as well. So that has been amazing. Um, for our staff, we also have wonderful panorama scores um, with our climate and culture. You know, some of the things that we do as well this year, we did start a staff of the month. It is nominated by other staff members and once a month during our staff meetings, um, they are recognized and they get little lapel pins. So on their name tags, they have the pins if they were nominated by a staff member and they get to hear why. Um, and just, you know, be thankful for each other. So that has been great. Of course, we always do lots of fun team building at the start of the year and fun days, but we're also learning together. We're doing book studies. You know, our um, PLC time is worked on learning, you know, working on growing and learning together. Um, and then those are just a few comments from our staff as well. But, you know, as we're continuing to grow, I think it's just, so important to focus on that social and emotional well-being of, of Kinnikerum as a whole. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation, it was awesome. <coughs> Ms. Wolf? I was a Kinnikerum cougar. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I know that school well prior to the the walls <laughs> being added but I really do like the family dance I was just at work the other day someone had said like um, all families don't fit into certain pockets so like if we had a father-daughter dance or a mommy-son dance we're going to miss some of our families so um, I think it's great that you have that and I just had a question on the um, was it called fun family afternoon of math or maybe yeah. I added the fun I don't know because um, I would I would need that um, but I was just gonna say also since it is during <coughs> the school day um, how are we potentially looking at um, students that have families that work different shifts wherever their jobs happen to be and if they you know so if I'm here with my nine classmates and everyone but me has a parent what's our plan yeah, you know, we actually decided to do it during the school day because of parent feedback. Um, we had some people say, you know, hey, I work nights, can we do an earlier time? So we're trying to kind of spread out those events during different times of the day. Um, but luckily, we have a lot of wonderful staff members too who I think will step up and help kind of fill that void if somebody isn't able to come in. Um, but I think we also have wonderful parents who will also welcome in other children too. Mr. Holinsky. Not so much a question. Um, I was gonna ask this, actually, same question that Eric already asked, but um, 
I like this. I love the fact, and the nail on the head for me is getting the parents involved. Um, because educating children is everybody's job. Everybody's job. Um, and I remember growing up, there was a uh, man by the name of uh, Mr. Siner who lived across the street from us. He was the DA for the county. And um, he would always pull the kids together, um, maybe go fishing somewhere in his backyard. He had a pond, those types of things. But he was not afraid to knock you in the back head with his knuckle either and grab you by the collar and haul you home and tell your parents what you did. Um, and when you hear stories about getting the parents involved, I remember Mr. Siner for those reasons because he was always teaching the kids. And these weren't, these weren't, he had a daughter. Uh, and that was it, but he was always with, uh, if he wasn't with her, he was always with uh, the kids in the neighborhood um, because it's everybody's job to really educate these kids. And so I, I, I love the fact that you're pulling the parents in uh, to uh, get them involved as much as possible. So kudos. Thank you. I think you're off the hook. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Eight is request to address the board. We don't have any, so nine is recess. We can go over that. 10 is reconvene. 11 information items. 11.1 uh, .1 staffing positions. Mr. Court, is it just you, Mr. Court? It's just me. Okay. You get me. Um, I do have some backups, so if you have questions that I can't answer, I do have some backups for you. So we have three. Uh, Informational items that we'll bring back for actions yet tonight um, for staffing requests. Um, so I'll kind of go through this, kind of give you a quick summary. Um, we'll just start with Westlawn first. Um, and Westlawn's asking for a 1.0 FTE social worker to begin in January. Um, I'll start with funding. They're using title funds to cover that position, so there's nothing out of the general budget, um, nothing from that line item, and Dr. Schroeder's on board with that um, as well. So. The position is um, Westlawn, quick history on it. Um, in the last six years, they've had three different administrators. You go back eight years, four uh, administrators have had, had changes there. Um, they also have 15 of their teachers are in their first three years of teaching. So new, new leadership along with a lot of new young staff, which is exciting, um, but comes with challenges, and especially coming off most of these teachers have started since pandemic or during pandemic time. So. With that, there's some challenges that come um, with the West Lawn and some of the, the supports they feel like would be very um, important for them to have for their students, their staff, and their families. Um, so adding this would provide the opportunity for more consistent implementation of plans, um, allow for maybe potentially on-site therapy, um, and allow for the ability to build relationships with parents and families. Um, this system of support can strengthen the leadership team, the counselor, the social worker, the principal and the academic coach, um, and so that they can meet the needs of all their students at West Lawn. Um, they currently have um, a social worker three days of the week. This would be in addition to that, so they would have one full time and still one three days a week with that position. Um, objectives 1.3 every student learns in a safe um, and resourced environment, and objective three every student is socially and emotionally equipped to thrive in school and in life. Every student will have meaningful personal connections to support their own well-being and develop their confidence, resilience, and adaptability. And so they're asking for that to be approved so that we can um, get the position posted and hopefully hire here as soon as possible. And again, that'll be funded through their title money. Questions on that, um, on that informational piece? I know there's more, more to it. Um, it's great questions? news. Nope. Are you, do you have any? Okay. Still me. Just okay. keep going. <laughs> Next one is at Dodge Elementary. Uh, Mrs. Everly has asked, this is a position that originally was a, a half-time secretary that they moved into, a, slid it to a half-time para position. And um, really her, her ask on this <laughs> is to move this from half-time to full-time. And again, funding-wise, um, this as well comes out of title money, so it's nothing out of the general budget. Uh, Dr. Schroeder's on board with this as well. Um, so this position is really geared towards their second and third grade students. Currently, they have one um, para to work with their second and third graders. They have four with their kindergarten and first. They have two with their fourth and fifth. 
Um, that's how they've utilized it in terms of what's needed. And they feel like having this person that they currently have as a half-time uh, moving into a full-time position, that 1.0 FTE, would really help their second and third grade because they're, they're missing part of the day with that extra support. Um, the good news is the person they have that's doing the part-time is very interested in moving into the full-time position. So it's one that we potentially could fill uh, ASAP um, if, if it's approved tonight. Um, so that's, that's how this position came, up, came about for them, um, basically kind of what they need and, and shuffling that around and using their title funds to support students and obviously their families as well. And the objectives for that, um, 1.3, again, every student learns in a safe and resourceful environment. And 3.1, every student is provided a personalized environment for learning. So question, questions on that? Okay. Um, the third one um, is our high school EL newcomers teaching teacher. Um, and here's what I'll just tell you. If you look at the numbers um, that's listed here, so at the end of May of 2022, we had 92 newcomers at the high school. As of November 30th, we were at 124, and we had five at the Welcome Center that were coming. So we have added close to 40 uh, newcomers um, since May, and we currently have four teachers. So you do the math. 124 divided by 4 is 31. So they're having class sizes for our EL newcomers of 31. And obviously, space is an issue with that. Um, and again, just adding that fifth person, um, we feel, is instrumental for these students that are newcomers coming in. And it's, it's just grown. Usually it's kind of, I think Dr. Labo said, Mr. Gilbertson, you know, that's kind of a up and down. We, we grow, then we shrink. We grow and shrink. We have not seen the shrink. It's continuing to grow, um, and we anticipate it not slowing down, at least not this year. So that number is probably going to continue to grow through the spring. Um, so I may be up here again later on um, needing some more support on that side. The funding for this um, with the high school, there's open FTEs that didn't get filled. Again, no hits to the budget. Um, Dr. Schroeder's on, on board with this as well. So as far as the funding side of it, it, it is there to utilize this. And again, potentially we, we have a candidate, um, so that makes it kind of exciting for this position. Because uh, again, a lot of, a lot of places it's, it's not easy to ha have an opening and then trying to fill it. Um, but we potentially have this one, you know, a candidate available possibly. So that's really the need is, is geared around what our kids need. Um, the, the numbers are just getting um, amazingly high that we haven't seen at the high school. Correct? <laughs> So I guess any questions in terms of that? Um, personnel committee was, um, had asked that we bring it to tonight for information and then for action as well, um, just due to the time, time sensitive of these three positions. Mrs. Sinkle. And that's what I was just gonna kind of mention is the discussion we had in the personnel committee. Um, great needs analysis on all of these so kudos to the team for putting that together because it's very <coughs> helpful to see that information um but obviously very needed positions you know we talked we talked a lot about the class sizes and so forth and we talked about how paras we need more paras and so this is another example of where we're bringing that on and trying to fill that need and then you know at the high school you know i know it's um we have no control over who comes to us or when they come to us. It's by law and by our mor morality that we need to teach those children because they are going to be here in our community. And, um, you know, the, <laughs> the best way to help out the community uh, is to make sure that they are well-educated and that they can, you know, get jobs or go on to college or whatnot. Um, so... It, it is concerning to see the numbers, but at the same time, it's what makes our school district wonderful because the diversity is what brings us the, the better options as a community and, and economically, it's the education that serves us well. So most economists would tell you 13 to one return on your money when you educate someone. So um, the <coughs> personnel committee was very supportive of all these positions and the timing we felt we needed to get out there so you could start the second semester with these positions in place mr olinsky just a quick 
clarification on the on the West Lawn one. Um, you're looking at 1.6 on the FTE. Is that correct? It would move up to 1.6. They're okay. currently 0. 0.6. Yes. Okay. Um, so is the amount that the fiscal impact that you have listed here, is that for 1.6 or is that just for the one? That's just for the additional one. Okay. Yep. Thank you. The, the 0. 0.6 would already be in this year's budget, so we're covered there. Dr. Bros. And I just want to clarify for everyone, Mr. Court, when you said there is no hit on the budget, we are talking about federal funds that come to the district for the purpose of Title I instruction, and those are the funds that need to be spent or we lose them if we don't spend them in an appropriate way. So we are using Title I funds for at least two of these positions, if I heard you correctly. That's correct, yes. And there, for that building, the building has the funds and how they utilize those, yes. Ms. Wolf. And I just wanted, did I show my, sorry, am I on? It's my first time. No. Um, I just wanted to confirm, you talked about the humans, uh, but especially with the high school position, we have a classroom. Do we have the space? Yes. Okay. I, I come from the time of when it was in the 100 ring and the old auto area, and I know it's different, but I was going to say um, I just wanted to confirm that we also have the classroom space. So thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. The hook. All right. Thank I'll you. be back for that right. later. Thank you. Okay. 11.2 construction update. <coughs> Mr. Petch. Thanks, President Albers. Um, presently, uh, ESSER three projects uh, ongoing uh, at the high school addition. Uh, weather's, you know, ho holding us back just a little bit, but uh, still uh, hoping that our contractor can get going with the uh, roof structure here in another three to four weeks. Uh, once that's in place, we can close the building and then we'll make plans to how we're gonna move kids around to get into the music area and things like that. So. Um, in progress, um, staying on schedule though, for, so far. Um, been uh, working on our, kind of our last uh, piece of the SR3, which is the security vestibules at seven buildings. And we hope to have that ready for uh, going out for a uh, proposal in, in February. Um, <clears throat> and then that'll be the last of, the, of those. Um, our goal is to complete all that work um, before the end of summer, so. Um, also, uh, in the works is project list. Um, we're, we're getting pretty close. My team's been working real hard with that. And uh, so I think we'll finalize that here uh, this month. Bring that along with uh, mass facility plan in January. So um, looking forward to that. Um, any questions? Any questions? Mr. Hall. When we talked about the vestibule projects before, we talked about all the projects that were on the list. Obviously, pricing was, was significantly higher than it had been, right, due to the pandemic or whatever the reason. Um, obviously, some prices have come down. Have you or do you um, have any idea how those numbers are going to look when you go uh, out for proposal on the vestibules? Are we going to see <laughs> a difference in what we thought? When well, I tell you, um, with Hester Threes has Davis Bacon law attached to it, so I, th I think that we're still going to experience costs that are more than we would hope for. Um, things are settling down a little. I'm hoping that this February time is better timing, that we can get uh, some good numbers um, from our contractors. Um, we'll, we'll see. I've got my fingers crossed, but uh, we did set this up so that our, our main project is the Walnut uh, Vestibule along with Howard and Gates, and then the other ones are set up as alternates so that we do open those proposals and we can't totally fund all the other alternate projects. Uh, what I plan to do then is then just redirect uh, general budget funds to accomplish those. So that way we've, we've got it designed, and then we, we've got a way we can pay for it, hopefully. As long as it doesn't blow the roof off uh, like we did with the Gates project. Thanks. Anybody else? That's it. Thank you. Thanks.
11.33 student representative report. Mr. Cloutier. <clears throat> uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to start off, uh, I'll be just discussing what the class officers uh, have been up to since we last spoke. Um, uh, most of what we've been doing is just planning and helping organize and design prom and stuff uh, related to that. So most recently, we visited Riverside, which is where it's going to be hosted this year, uh, and just sort of helped design the layout uh, with the people who we hired to decorate and uh, stuff like that. Um, the theme this year is casino, so that would be pretty cool. Uh, we're just working on that. Uh, then for activities, uh, winter sports have all begun, um, but obviously the bulk of the, the games and stuff will be happening after the break. For stuff like basketball, both basketball teams, both the wrestling teams, um, and then bowling, unified bowling, swimming, for all those. Um, but, I mean, there's been great starts to all of these, so a lot to look forward to, a lot to build on as well. Uh, and then for fine arts, um, they're doing good. After the break, show choir season, competition season is going to start. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, and then obviously most importantly, I guess, to the student bar body right now is um, it's finals week this week. So um, for students at least, there's going to be, you know, lots of studying and stuff uh, as students prepare for tests and as, as teachers help them prepare for tests as well. Um, I mean, I know personally... Uh, obviously, because it's uh, GISH, this applies to all the teachers there, but um, specifically for AP classes, lots of teachers have been uh, making themselves extremely available to students um, as, as much as possible and, and working really hard, uh, in some cases, uh, persevering through um, just obstacles and stuff that can come up, which is really admirable. Uh, I mean, there's lots of teachers that overcome a lot to, to try to help students. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I just, I just I sort of want to give a shout out to them because they make a lot of this this possible. Um, all the numbers that we you know like to that that's that all the successes and stuff it, it comes from that that effort. Um, I don't think that's something we should take for granted. I think that's super important. Um, anyway, but uh, I look forward to lots of success, uh, and we're, we're wrapping up a, a good a really great semester um, in my opinion. Uh, a lot accomplished by students and staff, and I personally feel very confident going into these finals and into next year. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cloutier. 11.4. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it was super discreet, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to tell you, Zach, I really enjoyed listening to your reports since you came on. Um, you are wise beyond your years. You um, think outside of the box, you care for people, and you listen. So please don't ever lose that. Thank you. Excellent. 11.4, uh, superintendent report. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I think tonight we'll give a few shout outs to our students. That's why we're here, our students and our staff, and so that will be our focus for tonight. So first of all, just want to recognize um, NSAA Believers and Achievers. We had one this year. Congratulations uh, to Isabella Moore. She's a, at Grand Island Senior High, was one of 48 high schoolers selected as the 22-23 Nebraska School Activities Association and Currency Believers and Achievers. Bella was honored for the program at the Class A Football Championship game in Lincoln at Memorial Stadium on November 21st. <clears throat> The statewide program recognizes Nebraska's future leaders and was designed to reward Nebraska high school seniors for their excellence in academics and participation in activities. So congratulations to Moore. We're always proud of our freshmen um, at Grand Island Senior High School's the Academy of Freshman Exploration when they host their business partners. Um, this has certainly been um, an endeavor since we've had the Academies of Grand Island Senior High School and every year our business partners, they come out to support our students. This year we had more than 25 business leaders and upperclassmen um, to help support our students on their career journeys. And I want to thank our business partners uh, for all of their collaboration uh, throughout our school district. We are able to offer some very unique experiences to our students because of their support. The next highlight would be our Hour of Code. Uh, we love 
coding and STEM within our school district. And this year, uh, the GISH IT Pathway students went on a district tour last week, bringing the Hour of Code program to Solid Park, Star, and Lincoln Elementary Schools. These high school students, under the guidance of their teacher, Mr. Fox, who is just amazing, um, he provided entry-level coding learning experiences to our upper elementary students. Thank you, Mr. Fox, and our students. Another shout out for Operation Warm. It is that time of the year where we want to stay warm. But last week, we had the Grand Island Fire Department at Grand Island and the Grand Island Police Department. They collaborated to bring over 100 winter coats to Howard Elementary as part of the nationwide Operation Warm. Let's give them a big round of applause for that. And so many special things like this happens because of our social workers. So thank you for your consideration of adding the social workers. They bring so much for our students. So thank you to Amy, Hannah, the social worker over at Howard for coordinating this event. Also would like to highlight our GISH scholarship fair. Um, it was a full house at the annual GISH scholarship fair last month. Again, our foundation, we know that is one of their stellar programs that they provide for our students. Um, this was a valuable event for our students so that hundreds of students and their families could learn about college opportunities, connect with schools like UNL, Doan, Wayne State, and others as well. We also work with Talent Creative for free professional student photos so that they can include these in their application. So thank you to our Grand Island Public Schools Foundation for all that you do for our students and helping them to put forward the best applications uh, possible so that they can achieve these very important scholarships. I also want to give a shout out to our Teacher Leaders Coalition. I want to thank Dr. Dexter and our cabinet team for leading these efforts. Our Teacher Leaders Coalition, they met again recently, and I just want to say how proud I am of this group. Um, this, we kind of turn, we move from just the regular Teacher Advisory Council to our Teacher Leader Coalition. This is an opportunity where our teachers, they're able to share concerns, but they're also able to build their leadership skills so that they can go back and have impact at their <laughs> campus level. They were able to, uh, discuss opportunities um, that they can support their colleagues with and just such rich discussions as we continue to talk about equity in our school district and having a lasting impact for students. So kudos to our Teacher Leader Coalition. Do want to shout out Gates and Hope Harbor. Gates Elementary, they recently raised and donated 570 cereal boxes. How many of us love cereal, right? 570 cereal boxes to the Salvation Army. Uh, for GIPS families in transition and Hope Harbor. It was so wonderful to see our students, our staff and families collaborating to make a positive impact. Way to go, Gates Gators. All right, since it's holiday season, I do wanna give a shout out to the high school. Uh, if you are in the Christmas spirit, please uh, join our staff at the Gish holiday celebration on Wednesday evening, December the 14th at seven o'clock p.m. We can enjoy welcoming music from the Gish, Gish Mariachi Band, as well as performances by Gish Orchestra, as well as the GIPS Children's Choir. So it seems like it's going to be quite um, an event. And to top it all off, for this special evening, we will be hosting Mr. Dwayne Milburn. He's a UCLA music professor. You hear me? UCLA music professor and a guest conductor. Always a, a wonderful celebration, and this year they've certainly taken it over the top. So please come out and help Grand Island Senior High School celebrate. And that concludes my report for tonight. Thank you, Dr. Grover. We will move on to action items. 12.1, uh, proposed 2023-2024 GIPS calendar. Dr. Dexter. I was just sharing that our guest conductors had some travel issues, <laughs> but uh, but he's supposed to be here um, getting into Omaha late tonight and then be here tomorrow morning. But he ended up from Los Angeles, tried to land here, went to South Sioux, tried to land there, then to Dallas, and then back to Omaha tonight. So so he's going to get here, but we, we are excited. All right. The um, elementary school, well, it's really this action item tonight is about adopting the staff calendar but we had some concerns with 
moving. Um, first of all, we um, did away with the early out Wednesday this year and just heard a lot of um, concern about lack of plan time. And so when we developed the calendar, we recommended that there be um, a 305 dismissal instead of the 330 dismissal. And then that came back with, um, but will we have guarantee, guaranteed plan time with that? And so Tony and I met with um, a group of elementary teachers, and it was just a great meeting, um, and just came together and just shared about um, where are we at, where do we need to go, how can we help support this? So we, we, we pulled together a set of norms, presume positive intent, listen without in judgment, seek to understand, share proactively, and be student-centered and solution-focused. And I can report that everybody on the team was there. Um, the purpose, feedback to inform future decisions with the elementary schedule for the 23-24 calendar. Um, we are making the recommendation that it go to 8 to 3.05 instead of 3.30. I used, with positive intent, um, the 415 time as a way to say, you know, when a meeting goes past 415, we need to start thinking about scheduling another one because holding teachers longer than that, just, it's not productive. But that kind of turned into, well, do we have to stay until 415? And so we had um, lots of conversation about that. The duty day to support students, the expectation is, is that staff be there 15 minutes before and 15 minutes after, um, be, be available to be on duty. We also use a 7.5 um, hour day when we're talking about, well, it, it's plan and prep. How long do we have to be here? Well, we just say seven, plan on seven and a half hours. But that's not written, it's not in policy, but it's a professional expectation. We also shared the um, professional responsibility um, and in policy and certified staff are salaried employees, not hourly. We work to meet expected professional responsibilities such as IEP, school improvement meetings, professional development. And then um, teachers were just asking, could we have clarification on when we're supposed to be here? And again, we go back to that duty day, 15 minutes before, 15 minutes after. If it's a non-student day, plan to be there seven and a half hours. So then we um, also shared a survey that went out just before Thanksgiving, and Tony's going to share some of those results. Okay. Good. Good evening. Um, so I have the multiple pages of the survey right here, um, just to show you that um, the, we did. I did read the results, and we tallied the results, and brought it to the team. And great, um, great feedback from the 140. Um, the, the 100, I think we had 157 some responses, um, 154 responses actually that uh, responded to the survey. And the three questions that we asked were, on a scale of one to five, how supportive are you with the recommended 305 dismissal? Um, one, not at all. Five, I'm fully supportive. Um, and then please share some information about the why. Why did you support or why did you not support the 305 dismissal? Um, really, we wanted to just get uh, their rationale for why they decided why they shared either way, and that was really informative information. So I'm glad we asked that question. And then the third question was, what guidance is needed to ensure teachers have the planning time, along with time to conduct those IEPs, continuous improvement, and, and participate in faculty meetings, which we know are really uh, critical um, for our continued success with continuous improvement within our schools. So on that um, scale. Um, you know, just on the responses, 154 responses of our elementary staff, we had um, about 70, about 80 percent of them um, either said a, a four or five that they were fully in support or most in support. 12 percent were neutral, um, and then the rest were, you know, there was a couple of not at all or you know the two, couple of twos. Um, the ones and twos sent their feedback was really just about questions within the schedule, like what's happening within the school day. Some teachers were really concerned about the amount of time that they had to be flexible with students, as well as to meet um, to meet some other um, things that they felt were critical within the school day. So I'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, some of the themes, the positives were um, this would allow us daily collaboration after school. We could have those IEP and staff meeting times designated and they wouldn't be going so late that we wouldn't get, pa get home past five o'clock. Um, that there's additional planning time that they could commit to or they, they knew was gonna be there on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, 
there are comments about extended learning opportunities for students that this would allow additional flexibility for those extended learning opportunities without going too late in the day for students. Uh, the consistency for the students was really important um, in the responses. They said it's great to have that um, release time early for students after a long day, but also just that consistency with the schedule in the five day weeks. Um, they also appreciated the protected PLC time that was still considered within the schedule for the school day. Some of the concerns that really surfaced as part of the themes, um, one of the most um, prevalent concerns was about flex time um, decreasing for our students, especially when it came to services for special education or um, for EL supports. Um, they wanted to have, what is that definition? Um, of how, how are we actually going to be serving the students um, that typically have received some additional supports during that time? And so we did talk with um, with uh, Dr. Levas and, and Renee Engel, we brought the, the, their teams in and consulted with them with our L4L coordinators as well and said, can we still make sure that we can meet the needs of our students giving a shortened schedule? Like where within the day can that happen without taking time out of core instruction? And they felt like we would be able to, to manage that within the school day and still meet student needs. Um, so the other, a couple of other concerns, um, specials, just that need to transition and, and making sure that that 15, 50 minute plan time was protected for teachers. And then our specials teachers were also wanting to make sure that they were considered for that 50 minute plan time as well so that they had that time to actually um, plan for students as well. Um, and then um, when we looked at the instructional time changes, the, the, the current calendar allows for um, had the calendar 10 minutes opening for 10 minute periods. Um, this would combine our calendar and opening for kindergarten. And then we, we would be removing that flex time. And we have um, taken the suggestions from um, the survey with their concerns about flex time and are talking about how can we at least embed that into, you know, maybe two to three days a week where there is that flex time for teachers um, to be able to do um, things that they felt like were important to them within their school day. Um, without taking away from core instruction. When you shorten a school day, you do have, something has to go and we have to really consider what is the priority um, that our kids need um, during the school day and when can they get that additional, um, that additional time built in. So we are taking that into consideration and looking at K, K3 um, and talking about how can we actually build some of that time back in, where would it come from and what would that look like it, as long as it doesn't take away from our core instruction that is so important to our student success. First um, and through third grade, um, we did a transition from 70 minutes of math to 65 minutes of math, so five, day, five minutes off um, every day for, for math will be, um, um, has been adjusted. And then social studies, uh, it's going from four days a week, but they'll have it five days a week now, but just for five minutes less. So there's just some small tweaks within um, the amount of minutes. And this went back to, of course, our coordinators who really studied and said, can we still meet the standards? Can we still make sure that we have the time in our schedule to teach the standards that our kids need given the shortened schedule with these time allocations? And they are assuring us that that is, uh, that is possible and it will all go back to our task force the summer to make sure that we are planning specifically and intentionally for that. And then for our fourth and fifth grade, um, they have gone um, from four uh, to 45 minutes of social studies four days a week to um, 30 minutes of social studies five days a week. And they still have flex time, it will be shortened from 25 to 15 minutes. So that will still be built into their day. Um, what stays the same, the four rotation specials, our lunch recess allocations, um, making sure that our ELA and science time allocations are remaining the same. Um, we still have wind time that can support math and reading, and then um, the 50 minute plan for PLCs. And of course, the other considerations that we had to make sure that we were able to meet full time requirements, the 1032 hours, using feedback from our elementary teachers, which we We've really taken that into consideration. They gave us, we had a really great discussion, um, making sure that we were getting to some clarity for them as we talk through what does this really look and sound like. So again, I can't say how much I appreciate their attending the meetings and, and giving us the feedback about what they're hearing and what they need. And then the input and guidance from the L4L team, making sure that we are prioritizing the most important and essential things within the schedule. 
So with that, we'll turn it back to Robin to bring some closure. So we worked through just all the why and what we re um, received from the feedback from the surveys. And so then we ended the meeting with what do we leave here to with today? What do we communicate with our colleagues? And what clarification is needed for this meeting, um, board meeting? Oops. Sorry, I lost my spot. So clarification, 750 to 320, what does it mean? That means 15 minutes before and after for student supervision. 745 to 345, what does it mean? The professional expectation to be in the building and available between the hour, the hour of 745 and 345. Support for special ed and, and er, English learners. Define time to meet student needs where in the general ed schedule and plan and lunch for our special ed and English learner staff. We tend to get rocking and rolling and get schedules rolling and it's like, oh, you don't get lunch in the schedule as a special ed teacher or English learner teacher. And so really, you know, working with our principals to, to, to find a way to make that work. That's how you keep Yale and special ed teachers. Summer work, brainstorm how to meet teaching requirements. Flex time. Flex time was really big. It's a, it's a time where a teacher can just gather everybody up and read a really great book, um, do a fun art project, but it's that choice time. And so look for ways to be able to incorporate that into the schedule. Uh, this one, faculty meetings, and I think Michelle Carter, myself, and Tony were the only ones that have been here long enough to remember. It was this huge master schedule of Mondays are IEP days, Tuesdays are this day, Wednesdays are, I'm like, well, when can you call a meeting? <laughs> but protected days. So we talked about for faculty meetings that we would um, propose as, uh, two scheduled faculty meetings per month, like example, first and third Tuesday, 50 minutes or less can't keep teachers there all evening. And then only if needed, purposeful, meaningful, and relevant. And then district meetings will not be held on designated faculty days, and, um, and that's really important. Um, trying to meet teacher needs, taking issues to heart will continue to drive that schedule, and the expectation to not take survey comments out of context. And um, we did share all of the comments with teachers and uh, were able to go through those. And, um, Bottom line, 80% um, supported the 305 dismissal. Questions about the feedback we gathered from just elementary teachers? Doesn't look like it. Okay. So tonight the um, action item is to approve the 2324 GIPS staff calendar. Um, and do you have any questions about that calendar? Any questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Make a motion to approve the 2023-2024 calendar as presented. Mr. Barsness and Mrs. Hinkle. Oh, you have a question? Oh, oh sure. <laughs> I just want to thank you for what you've done ever since the whole time I've been on the board, uh, elementary schedule has always been an issue. And I just remember Dr. McDowell saying one time, you just can't put everything into the day that you want to. Something has to give. Um, there's so much more we could do. We could probably keep kids 24 hours and be okay. But um, I, I appreciate that you as administrators, Dr. Grover, and even past superintendents have always been good about we try something, we evaluate it, we see if it works, and then if not, you make it tweak and you make adjustments. And I really appreciate um, how hard you've worked on this because, you, I mean, obviously with your results in the survey, you got the majority, but you're, there's still people that are, are never happy in, in it, and it's because some of it's individual preferences and so forth. And so I appreciate how hard you're working and um, still happy that we don't have the two o'clock days. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> Any other discussion? <coughs> Does, did we get a second for that? Yeah. Okay, all right. Did you get that, Angela? Okay, mm -hmm. go ahead and vote. Motion passes. Thank you, Dr. Dexter. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. 12.2, proposed updates to policy 2111 Board of Education Operating Principles. 
you know, and, uh, when you look back, it's on the very last page, but um, how many times we revised this? <laughs> but, you know, I've been, always been told, and I also taught, that um, your policy manual is a scrapbook of all your mistakes. You learn from them, and then you, you try to address policy to help you not make those same mistakes. But this policy is just, I mean, I've just been so impressed with all the work, um, and I've been here from the start with this policy, but it's really the board developing it, and, and what drives them, and how do we hold, you as board members hold each other accountable. So the, the major change on um, this revision is the um, professional development for the board. And so you'll see um, that the yellow was the latest changes and then the red is the overall change. You can see at the bottom the red that has a strike through that was in the, the current policy. So we are um, proposing, and this is for action tonight, that we update the um, professional development in the operating principles. I make a motion. There you go. Make a motion to approve the policy 2111 as presented. Mr. Barsonis, was that you, Mr. Brown? Mr. Brown, do we have any discussion on that? Okay, go ahead and vote. Motion passes. 12.3, Amplify Science Renewal. Mrs. Covarubias. Hi. So uh, last month I uh, presented information, um, and so this, this month I'm just um, hoping to get the ball rolling on Amplify. I did um, ask for an extension on the quote that they gave us, if you remember, was very good. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, just proposing that we adopt the Amplify Science for uh, the next six years um, with the attached quote um, on the needs analysis. I make a motion to approve the funding to renew the K-8 Amplify Science as described in the needs analysis. Mr. Barsonis and Ms. Wolf, do we have any discussion on science? Go ahead and vote. And the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Twelve point four staffing positions. Mr. Court. Yeah, uh, again, the, the first three there we have is the, the West Lawn social worker position. Um, and so again, just wanting approval so that we can move forward on, on that position. Make a motion to approve the staffing positions for West Lawn, Lodge, and Grand Island Senior High as presented. Mr. Barsonis and Mr. Brown, do we have any discussion on those? Go ahead and vote. Motion passes. Twelve point five special education paraprofessional longevity stipend for fiscal year 2022-2023 increase special ed para base salary for 2023-2024 and provide SE para's increase of 25 percent per hour for 2023-2024. Mr. Court. So this is uh, an item that I brought last month. Um, Dr. Schroeder and I um, did a lot of work, um, as well as uh, Mrs. Engel in special ed, find the funding for that, that stipend for our special ed paraeducators um, from preschool all the way up. And so we just need the approval for that and for the, the increase in special education pay moving forward. Motion, I make a motion to approve the special education paraprofessional longevity stipend for a year Fiscal year 2022-2023, the increase on the para base salary for 2023-2024, and provide the SE Paris increase of 25 cents per hour for 2023-2024. Mr. Barsonis, Mr. Halinski, do we have any discussion? Go ahead and vote. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. 
fiscal year 2021-2022 audit report and annual financial report. Dr. Schroeder. Howdy, folks. The annual school district's financial audit has been submitted to the NDE and the Auditor of Public Accounts. It's been reviewed by the Facility and Finance Board Committee. It was made available to the whole board and to the general public at the November 10th board meeting. Since that time, I've had no questions or concerns expressed to me regarding the audit. I would ask that you please approve the annual financial audit as submitted. Make a motion to approve the fiscal year 2021-2022 audit report and annual financial report as presented. Mr. Barsonis and Mr. Brown, any discussion? Go ahead and vote. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. 13 reports, Grand Island Public Schools Foundation report. <coughs> the foundation's online scholarship application went live on December 1st. Students will be able to apply for 160 plus scholarships through this application. The application is due February 8th, 2023. The foundation hosted their scholarship fair on December 1st at the Islander Annex building. The fair included scholarship application presentations from GIPS Foundation and the Greater Grand Island Community Foundation, as well as booths manned by several colleges, Education Quest, and the Academies of Grand Island Senior High. The foundation invested $1,184,062 into projects, programs, and scholarships benefiting our students last year. That number breaks down to $121.65 spent per student, that is, of 9,733 students. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mrs. Jurgens. 13.2 is the NASB monthly update, which can be found on their website, or you should have received an email. And 14 is uh, special recognition. 14.1, Board of Education member rec <coughs> recognition. Um, here comes Dr. Dexter. I'm gonna get work from this council. <laughs> Well, it's with heavy heart. Um, I came here 14 years ago and uh, Mr. Brown and Mrs. Hinkle were already on the board. And um, you know, when you think back of everything we've been through and what we've survived and, and still served students extremely well and um, just um, getting to know you and working with you has been an awesome experience for me. And then we also have uh, Mr. Barsonis, nine and a half years of service. Um, Mr. Bros, eight years, but I also got to work with Mr. Bros, Dr. Bros, as um, an administrator, and then um, Miss Wolf, four years of service, and I believe all four on the policy committee. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, Jane Meidlinger was always the the policy queen, and and, and now um, Erica has been became that and really appreciated her input and and um, she read the policy she dug in she had great questions and um, just really appreciated that um, you know and mr. Brown on finance and facilities just to background and able to connect and resources and contacts um, were awesome and uh, mr. Barsonis just the kind we can do this you know kept us going um, just really appreciated um, that about you and again, just again, heavy heart. Um, so, um, I don't know, just grateful that you chose to be um, of service to Grand Island Public Schools in all of your time and effort and heartbreaks and celebrations. But thank you so much, and I wish you the best. Thank you, Dr. Dexter. Does anyone want to have something to say individually? We have Kleenexes. Yeah. Ms. Jurgens. To my fellow board members finishing your time on the GIPS board, I will spend the rest of my life recalling all I've learned from you. Each of you has left an impression on me in ways I cannot fully express. Thank you for the robust discussions solution-seeking points of input, thought-provoking questions, and definitely all the laughs. 
Each of you has added value in immeasurable ways to GIPS, and I feel deeply fortunate to have spent my last two years as a fellow board member of yours. It's my sincere hope that our newly elected board members will see your commitment to GIPS, your openness to explore and entertain new ideas, and your bottom line of prioritizing our wonderful students as inspiration in their time of service to Grand Island Public Schools. Friends, thank you for being yourselves, which happens to be pretty extraordinary. Well done, Mrs. Jurgens. Mr. Helensky. I would just like to thank you guys for your, your, your dedication to this. Um, a special thank you out to Dr. Bros for being my mentor when I started because I showed up, knew, at, I thought I knew stuff and I didn't. Um, so um, thank you for breaking those down and the acronyms. Oh my God. Uh, so thank you for breaking that down. Uh, Terry, thank you for getting my, my jokes. Um, and um, Bonnie, thank you for navigating me through some stuff that I just didn't understand. Um, and, and Carlos and, and Erica, you guys are awesome as well. Um, Carlos, you'll be st probably still getting some emails and phone calls from me uh, because uh, you, uh, you're, you're, a, you're a leader and um, so I just want to pick your brain some more. So, so thank you for your time on the board. Mr. Holly. I broke the rules. I wrote nothing. <laughs> I'm not Lindsay, and I haven't been sitting here critiquing it for the last 30 minutes either. Um, you guys know me. I don't say much, um, and I don't do feelings very well, but what I will say is this. I feel like you guys have changed me. Uh, when I showed up on the board, um, I was one person, and then like I told Mrs. Albers, y'all messed around and sent me to a conference, and I learned some things, and and I'm a changed person, so, and, and each one of y'all has played a part in that. I sincerely appreciate you as people. I appreciate your service to this community and to, to the public schools, um, and I consider you all a lifelong friend, and we will be, we'll be talking down the road, so. All I'm gonna say is you're not gonna get rid of me that easy, and I have all your phone numbers, and um, I will be contacting you, and we'll still be hanging out, and. I will miss you each terribly. Yes. I just um, want to share too that I, I've said this before, but I've worked with 23 different Board of Education members, I think, over the last few years, and some of them for a long time, like Mr. Brown and Dr. Bros and Mr. Barsonis, and some of them for a shorter time, like Erica. But you do, you learn something from everyone that you work with. Um, the difference, the diversity in our thoughts, um, you know, I've done a lot with the neuroscience, I read a lot about that, how the more diverse your group can be, the better solutions you come to, and I, I really think that's what we've had on this board. And um, there's just so much to be proud of in what we've done in this district, um, how it has evolved over time. Um, you know, our district looks very different even than when we, I came on in 16 years ago. Um, the city's not the same, the school district is not the same, but that's okay. We celebrate the past and we embrace the future and our kids are our hope. And I, and I believe um, in all of our kids, um, they are going to be able to do great things because we have great teachers and administrators helping them out. And I, it was at the state school board conference. It was kind of cool. They did a little thing for some outgoing board members. And, and it was interesting that all the comments from these outgoing board members were the same, whether they were the small rural districts clear out in the panhandle or if they were, you know, Lincoln, those types of schools. And it all comes down to that as board members, even if you came onto the board for a different reason, you soon find that you have to have that narrow focus of what's best for kids, what is your why. And it's hard to navigate sometimes because what might be best for teachers or what teachers want, what might be best for parents or what parents want may not be what's always best for kids. And we are the voice of the kids as board members. Please don't ever forget that. The kids have no voice. They need the board members to be there for them. That's probably the number one job, other than hiring the superintendent, is being that advocate for all children because they all deserve the best opportunities in life. So it's been a pleasure. I am going to miss you, but it's time. So thank you.
Thanks, everybody. Anyone else feel like crying? No, nope, we all good? Oh, Mr. Brown? Okay, here we go. So um, I'll need the, I need to have a presentation to make. About 18 minutes of, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Just kidding, I would never do that to you guys. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank my family for the, the support and sacrifices over the last 18 years. It's been a lot, um, which has permitted me to really dedicate um, all the time for volunteering for this part of advocating for kids. It's been my pleasure working with all of you board members, all the administrators, all the superintendents, three and a half of <laughs> three and a half superintendents, um, all the teachers, the staff. Um, we went through bond issues, building projects, groundbreakings, um, grand openings. Those were fun. Uh, countless committee meetings, obviously, the board meetings, um, the professional development that we do our school visits, the district-wide activities that we get to, to go to and see our kids in action. It's truly been an honest, or, or it's been an honor for me to witness all this firsthand. Even though this really isn't exactly how I thought I would be ending my school board um, time, um, I've actually entered my own fight, um, and that's the fight against cancer. Um, So <clears throat> this, every board is different as we get people together. Um, and you guys are going to have a challenge ahead of yourself, just like we've always had. I feel like all the, that I've learned from being a board member, I'd like to pass on to everybody, but it's not that easy. You just have to experience it yourself. Um, but if there was one thing, and Bonnie already hit on it, um, I would say be an advocate for our kids. It's just easy. Um, it's not easy, it's just, it's easy to say, it's really hard to do. In Grand Island Public Schools, we have 10,000 kids here that, you know, are at the heart of every decision and every vote that we make. So pay close attention to what's going on, um, especially in the unicameral, because um, we fought um, to defend and add to the TOSA funding formula, and guess what? It's under attack again. And for, for school districts like Grand Island, we have a lot to lose. Our kids um, um, need to be, have to be have to protected. So moving forward, you just need to check your agendas at the door, roll up your sleeves, and, and get ready to learn and work together. Yep. Under 18 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Are you gonna say something? Oh, Mrs. Hinkle? Well, so Mr. Brown pointed out that I forgot to thank my family. <laughs> and that is, and I feel bad. It's like, it's when you hear those people do give their Oscar nom or speeches and they forget. But yes, if without our families and without them being supportive and giving us the time, especially like when your kids are school and you're on the board, you could never do it. So yes, thank you to my family. And thank you for reminding me, Mr. Brown. Mr. Barsonis. Oh, yeah, likewise. I, uh, I think my kiddos, there wasn't many, many meetings, uh, committee meetings and more meetings where I had a little kid under the, <laughs> and uh, thankfully they didn't cry. Um, but uh, thank you. It's been, it's been, it's been great. And I, I do, I, one of the things, I, I think I asked a lot of questions of Terry and he was mentor part of it. And uh, always I was freaking out on many things and decisions and why do we do this? And we learned a lot through the, through the, through the time. Um, Grand Island Public Schools, all the teachers, all the administrators. Um, this is the place that has made Grand Island home for me and has made me feel like home. I, I, if there's one something that I've always told everyone, uh, I think I've seen all of you cry. I have seen you upset. I've seen you happy. You've seen me cry. You've seen me laugh because we have a highly competent board and administrator that it wasn't easy. We had to challenge. I, I have questioned my beliefs, my principles, and everything in our conversations because we have 10,000 students, because we have so much at stake. We are different than the rest of the state. So, um, you know, as I was, as I traveled this last time, I kept thinking of always take the stairs, Terry. Um, as we were going on the escalator, always take the stairs, which is a reminder of sometimes you just have to take the stairs and put the hard work in. Um, Thank you all the administrators, all the teachers in our districts for everything that you do. Uh, truly, 
It's been a pleasure. And again, to my wife, to my kiddos, because many times they were here. And uh, I remember one of my kiddos, I was sharing with Dr. Grover one time while driving, and he asked me, so um, you know what I did and what Dr. Grover did? And I said, she was the superintendent over everything. And he's like six years old. And it's like, oh, so she's the real OG, huh? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you know, for whatever, I don't know, we were just having that conversation. But uh, I've met and we've learned a lot together. So thank you for challenging me to grow because uh, your example has kept me here. So thank you all. Ms. Wolf. You're my mentor, <laughs> Mr. Brown, and you carry my hair products, so thank you. I do, I do appreciate that. And you also um, find the best places to eat. So it doesn't matter where we are. You, yes, that's your leg. That's what I've learned, I mean. Yeah, um, but I was going to say, um, I started with Terry first just because of the fact that um, he got assigned to me. Thank you. Um, but really, each board member, no matter um, who they are, they're your mentor. They help you. Um, they can answer your questions uh, for you. And um, I know when I came on, because I have an education background, um, I thought I had all the magical knowledge um, that I would ever need in the world to understand how a school district works. Um, and no. Uh, so I was going to say I greatly appreciate, us, um, especially uh, Dr. Grover's cabinet, um, my silly questions, my very, very serious questions, questions I wasn't sure why I was asking, but then when we got an answer, I was like, that is why I asked that. Um, I appreciate your time and your dedication and your service to our students. Um, while there is a lot of work um, in late nights, um, some you guys uh, spend a lot of time with us um, and informing us of situations, information, things that we need in order to do what's best for students. So thank you so much for that. Um, not, and I'm not gonna point out each one of you as a board member. Y'all got a card from me. So enjoy it, eat a cake pop. No, I did not make them. I'm not that talented in life. Um, but I do want you to know um, I appreciate each and every single one of you Thank you so much, Dr. Grover, for your service um, and taking, uh, you know, me under your wing in the sense of I was the only one that came on when it was my turn. So um, she definitely and uh, Bonnie definitely helped explain to me um, coming in and joining because I was just a singleton. Um, I wasn't coming on. I had no friends coming with me. Um, and so, um, but I made friends when I came here. So I just really do um, appreciate the knowledge that um, you took the time to help me understand. Um, so that way we could help make the best decision for students, for our fu future and coming board members. Um, I would like to tell you you don't know what you don't know and that what you think you know, you don't know. So I wish everyone the best on their future endeavors and I look forward to seeing you when I randomly happen to be at an event. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Dr. Dan, I was like, they're all pointing. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of us who spend this weekend in a reunion in Colorado, and there were nine of us there this year, and they all knew that I was leaving the board, and every one of them said to me, what are you going to say? I said, I don't know. Are you going to prepare something? I said, I don't know. And one of the ladies <clears throat> who spent her life as a clinical psychologist said, if I were you, I would listen to what everybody says, and if you can't add anything, don't. <laughs> and I thought that was the best advice I could get from my great friends who meet us every year in Boulder, Colorado. And I had to drive like crazy to get here because we usually don't <laughs> meet on Monday and we usually don't get back until late Monday evening, but I've enjoyed every minute. 
I think Bonnie helped me make the transition from being a school administrator to being a school board member, and I have to give her props for that. And the rest of you, you've heard it all from everybody else, so thank you. Okay, we moving on? Thanks, friends. Fifteen, executive session to receive legal advice for negotiations and because closed session is clearly necessary to protect the public interest and to prevent the needless injury to the reputation of an individual. Do I say 16 and 17 now, Bonnie? Okay. Make a recommendation for the board to convene to executive session for the purpose of receiving legal advice for negotiations. Second. Mr. Barsonis, Mr. Hawley, any discussion on that? Go ahead and vote. Motion passes. We are going to executive session.
reconvene from executive session. Mrs. Hinkle and Mr. Barsonis, any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes. I have to get on my computer. Uh, 19, approval of any action deemed necessary as a result of executive session. 19.1, approval of the resignation and transition agreement with Dr. Tawana Grover. Okay, I'm going to read a letter. Dear Grand Island Public Schools Board of Education, when I joined Grand Island Public Schools, it was my first time stepping foot in Nebraska, and I immediately fell in love with the heart you had for supporting students. Now in year seven of my tenure, I look back and I am overwhelmed with gratitude for the work that we and all the partners that came alongside us have accomplished. In many ways, GIPS has raised the bar and set a path for innovative programming, transformational leadership, and maintained a steadfast commitment to students. Serving as the superintendent of Grand Island Public Schools has been one of the most extraordinary and inspiring endeavors an educator could ask for. However, as we face the dawning of a new season, we find ourselves facing new terrain. In, light, in that light, it is with a heavy heart that I submit my letter of resignation. I have always been proud to work for the Grand Island Public Schools Board of Education. I want to thank you for your courageous and unwavering leadership. Some of you I have known since 2016 and others along the way. No matter when or how we came to work together, I am grateful for the opportunity. Your commitment and service has been admirable. You always held high expectations for us as your leadership team and as a district. I always wanted to live up to your expectations because I saw firsthand how much time and dedication you poured into the district. I saw firsthand how much you cared about children. I saw firsthand the tough decisions that had to be made in real time. I watched you unapologetically keep our mission at the forefront. During these past years, we have seen our share of challenges, but we also saw a great deal of successes. When I look back on my tenure here, please know I will be at peace knowing we unified for every student every day a success. Upon acceptance of resignation and transition agreement, I say thank you for allowing me to journey with you. Sincerely, Dr. Tawana Grover. Mrs. Hinkle. I would recommend that we accept Dr. Grover's uh, resignation. The agreement is, is that she will uh, be here until July 11th, I believe, or January 11th, sorry, sorry, January 11th, um, that we will pay out the remaining of this year's contract with full benefits and then pay out year two contract with just the salary amount and not the benefits. Year two, year two, year two of the contract. Year two yeah. of the contract. Second. Mrs. Hinkle and Mr. Barsonis, any discussion? Let's oh. Oh, what? I, I have some discussion. Okay, Bonnie has some discussion. Yeah, sorry. No, that's good. Dr. Grover, it's, it's very, very bittersweet. I, I'm sad that one of my last votes will be to, have, to accept your resignation, but I fully support your decision. When we were looking for a superintendent in 2016, we, the district was in a good place, but all of us board members at that time recognized that we were at a tipping point in our district. Our numbers continued to grow, our diversity continued to grow, our poverty continued to grow. 
and we knew we needed, in order to change and truly make a difference for our children and their education, we needed second order change, which means significant change, which we knew that would be hard for some of the people currently in the district to accept, but we knew that's what our children needed. So when you came to the district, that's what we asked you to do, and you did that. I mean, in 2017, we had nine needs improvement school districts, and by 2020, it was down to two. We, had, we were in such a celebration mode, and then the pandemic hit. And you know what he said earlier, Dr. Hudnall, about how we will always look at things pre-pandemic and post-pandemic is so true. We cannot underestimate the significance of that. But even through the pandemic, because you helped us create that strategic plan, we stayed true to those objectives we had always put forward. And number one was the North Star of our high school graduate. Everything we did was leading our children to be able to graduate, to go career college ready. And you did that for us. I'm so, um, during the pandemic, it, it really came out. There was some of it before the pandemic, but definitely during the pandemic. The very covert, hateful things that were said to you were just so wrong. And I've told you this privately, but I wanna say it publicly. I'm sorry I didn't do more to protect you because you were doing what we asked you to do and you took the brunt of it. And it was hateful, much of it but you were so graceful. I'll never forget one time you told me, we were talking about somebody that had said something very horrible, one of your peers that should have known better, and you said, I feel so sorry for him. He doesn't know what he's doing. What grace and composure you had. Uh, and you said, it's okay, it's my job as a superintendent to take this. And all we were trying to do was to keep kids in school keep them healthy and keep their teachers healthy because we knew the best place for our students was in school and we got all those letters from community members and never once did they mention the children it was always about adult issues how this impacted adult issues thank you for having the courage to stay strong and to lead us through that because we can take pride in knowing that a district of our size and diversity was one of the only ones to stay open full-time during the pandemic our kids needed that. Some people motivate by manipulation and some people motivate by inspiration. And you motivated by inspiration and you should be proud of that. So many of the, the, the accusations that have come especially lately, it's interesting because our past superintendents did the exact same thing. But why they attacked you, the, the only thing I can think of is that's different is that you're a woman. And, I, 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 and that makes me sad. But accusations are confessions. And I believe there's an intent to do the things that they were accusing this board of doing. The intent is to do it as they go forward. But you know what? I believe that once you get in the seat, and once you're responsible for the kids, because like if we had made it any, it would have been so easy during the pandemic to make different decisions, to make certain mem members of our community happy. But if we had done that, how would we have felt about ourselves? We didn't have all the information. Nobody knew for sure what was gonna happen with it. Could we have lived with ourselves if we made different decisions? And I think when you get in this seat and you understand the gravity of the impact that you're having for 10,000 children on a daily basis, you just know it. So, and I believe in you're putting us in a really good spot. We are in a great spot and we have, you have a very good cabinet. Those administrators are gonna keep this moving forward. Our teachers, the majority of the teachers are really great teachers and they will be here for our kids as will all our classified. I believe that love is stronger than hate and hate might win for a brief moment but it will not endure. And I believe our kids have so much to teach us. We've had students here talking about how they've had to learn to work with people that are so different from them and they've made it work. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Grover, I have to tell this story. The first day of school when you came here, we went to Shoemaker for the first day of school. 
And I'll never forget how those children looked at you, especially the young girls of color. And you could just see the hope that you gave them just by being who you are. I'm not worried about you at all. I know you're gonna do great things and some other children are gonna get the benefit from you. And I know that in time, you will be so appreciated in this district. You're just like those great artists that are appreciated after their time. I know that'll happen. God bless you and thank you for everything that you've done for us in our district. Mrs. Jurgens. I prepared something. Don't judge me. <laughs> Dr. Grover, in your time with GIPS, you led with a listening ear far more than you did with a microphone. Your leadership is most obviously displayed by your desire to learn all the aspects of situations and challenges, bring in experts and those with lived experience, and ask pertinent questions all before making decisions. In my two years serving GIPS as a board member, my respect has only grown for you. As I have had the honor to see up close your pronounced heart for the children of GIPS, I will never forget the conversations we've had where you've shared with me why you do what you do and how we must all remain focused on our mission. I see your book of work here. I see it in the progress we've made as a district the miles of innovation and evidence, and the spirit of collaboration and problem solving you exude. Additionally, our administration and faculty consistently show and share their passion for the work they do, and I feel that's also a testament to your leadership. Thank you for letting our superstars do what they do so well. Thank you for inviting our teachers, students, and parents into conversations again and again, requesting honest feedback and ideas for improvement. Dr. Grover, I have been saddened and disappointed by the displays of misogyny, racism, and bullying targeted at you. And yet at no point did you stoop to what would have been an on-par response to the name-calling, yelling, or social media crucifixion? Instead, you continued to carry yourself with poise and kept your focus on GIPS. In any future ventures you may explore, I have zero doubts you will continue to perform with excellence, elegance, and your solution-seeking mindset. Thank you for all you contributed to Grand Island Public Schools, Dr. Grover. You leave some big shoes to fill. <laughs> just know that just because the rest of us aren't saying anything it doesn't mean that what everyone else said isn't completely heartfelt and dittoed from all of us. We all feel the same way. She has our complete and utter support until the last day she is in this district, and that will never change. Do you have a question, Bonnie? Sorry. Now we're gonna vote. Motion passes. 19.2, approval of hiring the Nebraska Association of School Boards to conduct an interim superintendent search. I move to approve the resignation. Hold on. There. There you go. I move to authorize the board president to contact to contract with the Nebraska Association of School Boards to immediately begin the search for an interim superintendent and authorize the board president to take all the other necessary action to assist the Nebraska Association of School Boards to begin advertising, recruiting, screening, and scheduling the interim superintending search process. Mr. Barsonis, Mr. Holinsky, any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes.
20, notification of upcoming board meeting, uh, January 12th at 5.30. 21, adjournment. We are adjourned. <laughs>